This is the last exercise in the probability chapter. We've considered in exercise one just what probability is, how we might define it. This was looking at uh, more complex events where you've got uh, multiple events occurring together. And now we look at conditional probability and independence. So conditional probability is becoming more complicated where you've got some sort of a perhaps a restriction of the sample space occurring. So you are saying things like what is the probability of something happen given that a certain event has already taken place. Uh, this makes sense to us if we think about um, you know what is the likelihood of say a particular cricket team winning. Well we might uh, not be too sure before the match but let's say three quarters of the way through the match we're asked the same question. Well we have certain facts now which changes the probability we not, might know that a team is doing very well or perhaps it's very close whatever the case may be what players are still in and so there are certain conditions now which didn't apply before because we've got information that we didn't earlier have. That changes the probabilities. And last of all we look at uh, uh, independent events, two things which um, don't uh, in any way um, overlap with each other. Uh, well, we'll look at that, that the way that, uh, that works. So conditional probability and independence. Well, this is how we write conditional probability problems. We say probability of A given B and that's the way we write it with that little bar through the center. And what it means is the probability of A and B so if we've got the two of them together and that means intersection over the probability of whatever this event B might happen to be. Let's look at an example. What's the probability of getting a 3 on a standard die, that's a six sided die, if we know that the number thrown is less than five. So this changes the chances, doesn't it, if, we, if we're told, okay, what's the probability of getting a three, but we know it's less than five. So in other words, less than five is not a five or a six. So suddenly we're in a situation where instead of saying, oh, well, it's one out of six, we know it's not a five or a six. So in fact, let's look at it this now. The probability of getting a 3 when we know it's less than 5 is the probability of getting this 3 in intersection with the possibility of these four numbers here. So the probability of getting a 3, the one that's in intersection, the one that's only common is the probability of a 3. So what's the probability of a 3 with a six standard with a six sided die? It's one out of three out of six. And what's the probability of getting then these four numbers here? The probability is 4 over 6. So we've got 1 6 divided by 4 over 6. Remember your fractions. A fraction divided by a fraction is the same as a fraction multiplied by the reciprocal, flip it over, or 1 in 4. And that's what it comes down to. One chance in 4. You could actually see that from here, couldn't you? There's only one of those and four of those. So the probability of getting a 3 given that the numbers uh, thrown is, le is less than 5, if we knew that, is 1 over 4. So this is the, the um, this formula here. We've already had the addition law. Now when we rearrange this, we end up with what's called the multiplication law. So just simply multiplying this by probability of B. That's the multiplication law and something that, that we'll find uh, useful. So again, let's consider two events where event A is following event B. This is where this using the complement is useful to have and using a tree diagram. Here we have the probability of A happening or not A happening, whatever that might be. So this is another way of writing something. So this, for example, could be throwing a coin where A equals getting tails. So not A equals not tails, which of course is heads. And so we need to think of when we've got two choices as one being one thing and the other being not that thing. That's perhaps an easy way to remember. So I've got 
phones going off here and all sorts of things. So here we've got the first event, this happening. So what's the probability of these other events happening given that we've already had something else happen? So A has happened and then some other event happens, B happens or not B happening. So what we, why we're doing this is because we're looking at this in terms of conditional probability. This event here, getting a result A and then getting a result B, would be written as the probability of B happening, given that A has already happened. The probability of B happening, given that A has already happened. This one here is the probability of B, B dash, or B, the complement of B, or B not happening, given that A has already happened. And that's the way that's written. So you might like to reflect on that little bit of a table there just to get your head around that way of thinking because it's a bit confusing when you first hear it. Independent events. Well, an independent event is where you've got uh, two events and as we see there's no intersection, or rather the intersection between them is, is, the, um, is the, uh, the product of those two, two events. So if we've got uh, B having no effect on A, that's when they're independent. So what's the likelihood of, uh, I don't know, um, we had babies before, I've got them in my, on my brain because I've got a granddaughter now, uh, what's the, the probability of a, a woman having a boy and the next woman that's wheeled in to have a, have a baby having um, a girl or a boy? Are the two events connected? Does what the first woman have have any bearing whatsoever upon what the sex of the next baby will be. And we know that it doesn't. They're two independent events. So if that's the case, the probability of A, given that B's already happened, in other words, the probability of, of uh, the second woman coming in having a boy, given that the first woman's already had a boy, it's just simply the probability of, of having a boy, because what the first woman had has nothing to do with it. So that's, the, uh, that's what independent events are. So now look at some problems. This is just straightforward using the formula. So you've got the probability of A, the probability of the intersection of B, find the probability of A given that B's already occurred. We've got B. Uh, we need to work out what, the, what uh, some other probabilities are. This is the formula here that we used, that we were given earlier. And so we see that it's got this in it. It's got the probability of B in it. So we can just use that to work it out. Notice how I've done it. Just a little arithmetic thing. 0.3 over 0.5 is not a fraction, they're decimals. And so we would just divide them to get 0.6. However, we can multiply both the top and the bottom by 10. I shouldn't really have to talk about this in year 12, but I'll mention it anyway. Um, 10 over 10 is just 1. 10 times 0.3 is 3. 10 times 0.5 is 5. So that's where I got my 3 fifths from. You need to be able to do things like this with ease. Hopefully you can. Uh, moving down a little bit further, um, again this one here, uh, again you're given these details here. This was a little bit more complicated because if you've got the union, uh, the formula we used before, if we just have a quick look at it again, has got the intersection of, but this problem here gives us only the union. So we've got a problem, we had to work out what is this intersection. So I've used a Venn diagram to do it. And I've said, look, what's in the Venn diagram is uh, X, Y, and Z. I've just called it. You call it whatever you like. Um, the union of the two is equal to this plus this plus this. So I've said, OK, well, we know that it's 0.68. So X plus Y plus Z, whatever they are, come to 0.68. The probability of A is X and Y joined together. And that's equal to 0.37. And the probability of B, that's Y and Z joined together, that's 0.56. So I've looked at this and said, well, look, X and Y together, that's probability of A. We know that. Oh, look, here's X and Y together. So now I can put 0.37 and replace those. So I've got 0.68 equals 0.37 plus Z. And that let me go down and work out what, uh, what um, Z was equal to. And then I was able to use Z to work out uh, what the rest was equal to. Uh, what y was equal to, which was what I was after. Um, so that was relatively easy. And then for the next part here, I had to find the exact value. That was what I needed this for. And so I've just used my probability of a, b, 
and what the intersection was along with the formula to work that out. So that was pretty pretty easy. Um, I've used a tree diagram here and I've used this thing here of uh, throwing a coin, getting a head or not head, in other words a tail. When you throw it the second time you throw it you get head, not head, next time head, not head and so on. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight things could happen where it goes head, 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 not head, head, not head, 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 not head, not head, got a lot, and so on. In other words, heads, 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 tails, heads, tail, head, and so on through it. So then what's the probability of getting three heads? Well, it's only here. It's only, uh, only one chance of getting that. However, this is a conditional probability problem. So notice it says it is known that at least one toss resulted in a tail. So this one here where there was head, 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 did not happen, which is why this, 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 all the rest of them have an asterisk next to them as being the possibilities. That first one's not a possibility because we know that we've got a tail. That's why it's a conditional probability problem. And so that being the case, that changes it. So there's in fact only seven ways and not eight as to how we can uh, get there. So what's the probability of getting three heads? Well, that's why it's zero because we know that at least one was a tail. What's the probability of getting at least one tail? Well, getting one tail, not at least, getting one tail exactly. Well, if we go along this pathway, that's a possibility. There's only one head there. Uh, this one here, head, tail, head, yep, that's a possibility. So there's two. Head, tail, tail, no. We only want one, t one tail. This one here, tail, head, head, yes. And all the rest have two or three. So we, in fact, only got in here three pathways where we get one tail. That's three out of seven, and so on. Looking further on, uh, look, I think, again, I'll flick through this because I've tried to explain it um, fairly well, I think, in here um, with these problems. Um, in here, as soon as you see something like this, given that, then you know that it's that type of uh, type of problem. I've got no idea what that's there for. I think I can delete that. So, um, yeah, I think that's probably enough for you to go on. I've tried to explain that pretty well as I've gone through. So that's the end of Chapter 7.